Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Good afternoon. With me today on the podcast is a past guest. It is Rebecca Growlick. She was on the episode Caregiver Pathways, and I recently touched base and checked back in to see how that program was going. If you've heard that episode, you knew that I had intended to go on one of the outings with her group, and then all of a sudden it's now October and it didn't, it didn't happen. So thanks for being with me again, Rebecca. I understand things have pivoted a little bit. They have, they have, Jen. So originally as Caregiver Pathways, the objective, our goal was to take people who are in the early stages of uh, dementia out into the community to do volunteer work so that they felt that they still had purpose, they were still needed, still valued by society. Because truly, even in these early stages, they do have a lot to contribute. What we found though, was it was a hard population to base a business on because although the activities were a lot of fun, Sometimes um, a person is just a bad day. So last minute something happened and they, they weren't able to come or they weren't in the mood to come or a doctor's appointment came up. And we realized that there are also a lot of small boutique organizations, people who are doing different types of activities or art projects with people with dementia. And we, as we looked out, we realized People in the early stages of dementia are oftentimes isolated because of their condition. But there's really a bigger population of seniors in general who are isolated and lonely. And those with dementia are like a subcategory. And there are, as I said, a number of different individuals or organizations that are trying to target the isolation and loneliness among seniors. We decided to change our direction and we're now a foundation raising money to then turn over to people who are focused on activities. So we're really excited because we're getting a lot of um, recognition and uh, support for what we're doing. And then we'll handle all of the paperwork and all of the logistics of getting the money to the right organizations. So I, um, I'm in the process of the final paperwork to get a $5,000 grant from Sacramento County there's a woman who, uh, named Laura Wayman, who is known as the Dementia Whisperer, and she's starting a campaign and um, a fundraising, and we're one of two nonprofits that she's going to be raising money for. Because, you know, the, her interest is, in her case, people with the, uh, dementia and the isolation and loneliness they experience. So her money will be, you know, targeted to that population. But instead of her having to do all the legwork to find the those who are supporting those people, um, that population, those people, will do it. You know, and we'll definitely give recognition to those who who give us the money. That sounds fantastic. And I've met her twice. Okay. She's talked twice, once at a support group and once at an adult day program here in my hometown. I know we're not super far apart, so it's not surprising that. That we've run in the same circles a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, she's speaking, my business partner, whose name is Renee Balcom. Renee and I are co-teaching a six-week class through the Sacramento State Renaissance Program, which is a program for seniors, an educational program. And we're doing a six-week course called Enlightened Aging. And we're targeting different different aspects of aging, and one of which is dementia. And is that a normal part of aging or not? And Laura will be one of our presenters at that. Oh, that's a really good class. It's, we're getting a, a lot of people have signed up. We're excited. We're, um, we're doing a number of different uh, kind of key topics, including preparing for your death. I mean, what do you need to do to get all your, uh, your documentation in order, what's palliative care, what's hospice care, when should you solicit those support systems. Uh, another one is the healthcare system and just how to navigate the healthcare system. So, so we're excited, we're really excited. We, we think that this is important information to share. It is and getting it all in one location 
is useful because as we've talked, there's a lot of resources and a lot of help, but it's scattered everywhere and it's not necessarily easy to find the population that we're trying to target isn't always as tech savvy. And I just talked to, I'm assuming he was fairly young, a, a person that had taken care of his mom through um, cancer treatment when he was in college. And even he didn't look for certain things in like apps or in technology. He, he as a, he's either like at the very end of the millennials or the very beginning of the Gen Z if he wasn't looking for a technology solution to the challenges of caregiving, there's very little hope that the older people are looking for it. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, the problem with caregiving is it's not something you plan on doing. Most people do not plan to be a caregiver. They're not prepared to be a caregiver. And frankly, a lot of people don't want to be a caregiver. But what happens is, you start your day normally and then the phone rings and you get a call dad fell off a ladder mom was in an accident child was you know hit by a baseball bat there's just something that changes your life dramatically in the life of someone you love and care for and then you're thrown into the situation where you need to find resources and that's just one of many demands you have. I mean, you're coping with your emotions. You're coping with the emotions of the person who now needs care. You've got all this input from family and friends, most of which conflicts with one another. And then you're scrambling to find, find solutions. And, um, you know, as we were talking prior to the show, Renee, who is my business partner, not only are we doing the nonprofit and whose name is now Rose Bear, R-O-Z as in zebra, E B E A R, but we also have co founded a for profit called the Silver Lining Network and Directory. And it's exactly for what you're talking about. It's a directory with care categories and for easy to find solutions to your caregiving problems, connections, people who can provide service or products. You're absolutely spot on. It's overwhelming to find solutions you need. I think a lot of times you don't even know what solutions you could look for yeah like you don't this, even know to ask yeah this guest that i talked to that i'm pretty sure was young he works for a company that has a medication management app and they've actually been around for a decade which with app the app store that's that's a long time yeah <laughs> and there's a lot of benefits to it one of which was medicine um adherence so you know when the doctor says you know for simplicity take this antibiotic three times a day for 10 days that's what you need to do even though at day six you're feeling totally fine and you think i'll just save the rest of it for next time i get this crud and the next thing you know you're not you're not well now if you do that with your diabetes medications or your um you know, your anti-seizure meds or whatever, any, anything you might, he, he was saying that just improving the way their app helps improve medication management and adherence saves Medicare like $300 billion a year. And I was like, that is a huge number. And I, I wish I had it. known about that when my dad was in the hospital. Now we didn't have to manage his medication, but I think he might've actually really liked this app because it's got some really good features some of which are free the sharing with the family is you know a three dollars a month really inexpensive so you guys have to tune into that episode but we're here now today to talk about what Rebecca's doing so <laughs> but but your point about the medication app and, and taking the meds is a really important one my mom had Parkinson's and I can tell you Parkinson's medication must be taken at basically the same time every day. And so having that uh, assistance is a good thing when you're juggling so many balls, it's easy to forget. Well, and they've designed the app, basically it's senior friendly, which I'm assuming is large font. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of text on your phone. And when you, it'll, you set up the time to take it, and 
um, exactly what it is you're taking when and how much, all the details. You take it and then you just hit a button on the app and it says taken. So you actually have a record that you did take it. So if you get distracted and you're like, did I take my Parkinson's meds? You can go and look. Or your family can check in and make sure you're taking it when you're supposed to. You can send the report electronically to the doctor. I mean, there's just, just that little, little bit I think is so helpful. And it's like, I didn't hear about it until they approached me. And it's like, why did, you know, I never thought about looking for medication apps on, on the app store or, you know, the only thing I ever really looked for online was a support group for people like myself, you know, Alzheimer's caregivers and a podcast to supplement the, the support group. And at the time, almost two years ago, it was, there wasn't, there was basically one that's been around a long time and it didn't speak to me. It just, it wasn't what I was looking for. And that's how I ended up creating my own. <laughs> and I've found, and I, you know, many of my guests have found that um, finding the caregivers is, it's like looking for the needle in the haystack sometimes. And that's really frustrating because the more we can help support them in this journey, you know, especially people like myself and my sister who are still working. And my sister has one kid in elementary school and a freshman in high school. So she's got a lot on her plate. Now, mom is well taken care of in, in the residence that she's in. So that's fine. I deal with the doctor's appointments because I'm the healthcare power of attorney, which that's a pain in the butt, however. <laughs> and, you know, it's like we don't have the demands that other people do you know we're not trying to check in with mom and dad who are still living in their home and i know when probably in 2013 14 15 i was trying to figure out ways to help without upending my life and i never came up with a solution and i didn't look for apps which was kind of dumb <laughs> well and that's why renee and i have founded the silver lining network and directory for that very reason, because um, it's so hard for caregivers who are juggling all sorts of um, responsibilities to find what they need and to find it quickly. So if it's okay with you all, just let me just read the um, nine categories of care, which will give you an idea of like all the, just the diverse demands that a caregiver needs to focus on. So we have um, transportation and mobility, housing, caregiving and care coordination, safety, health and well-being, daily living engagement and lifestyle, end of life, financial and legal affairs, and estate management. And I'm sure you know perfectly well, we could have come up with another nine categories. You know, there's just so many demands, but we thought those really encompassed the majority of the demands. So you're right. The, for a caregiver trying to figure out what, um, where to find their resources is a job into itself. In fact, I, I knew a, a man, or I know a man who was telling me that his mother-in-law was diagnosed with dementia and he and his wife didn't know what the word meant. Oh, like, what's Lord. that? <laughs> so, so for people like you and me who are in the senior industry and working with this, it's hard to imagine, but for people who, who aren't involved in typical senior issues, to get a diagnosis of dementia, they have no clue what it means, much less where to find resources. That's a, interesting because if, if you recall, which you might not because it's been a while since we talked, my maternal grandmother and great-grandmother had no memories at the end of their life. I'm assuming my great-grandmother must have had Alzheimer's. They called it senile dementia when she was alive and she died before I was born. So I, I don't have any serious details about her, just some stories that my grandmother would tell. And my grandmother either had severe brain damage that started at one level and got worse and worse, just like an Alzheimer's patient from an aneurysm that she had had, or she did have undiagnosed Alzheimer's. She's gone, so I will never know, but 
I don't really have a good family history, but I was very familiar with memory loss and the and what it was like to deal with somebody in that situation. I had no clue. I remember once I I ended up babysitting my grandmother and nobody told me what to do if she had a panic attack or you know I it was just like okay we're off to do whatever I don't even remember where my mom was going and the day started out okay my grandmother rec remembered who I was and I thought this is okay like, you know a lot of repetitive statements but as the day moved along at one point she said well, now don't be rushing into marriage. And I had a really hard time not laughing at her because I've been married for 16 years. And I thought, yeah. what the hell do you think I am? I mean, it was just yeah. zero clue on how to deal with her. And before I started the podcast, I just assumed that Alzheimer's just kept stealing more and more and more of your memory until essentially there was no memories left memories to you know how to eat how to walk you know the basic like programming that we have learned for basic living but after talking to you know the people in my support group and different guests i've learned that there's a lot more to the brain disease than i understood and understanding it better really helps me deal with my mom better <laughs> which is good for both of us that's right. That is good for both of you. And there is a lot and they're continually learning more. So, um, and, and a lot of people do think that dementia means memory loss, but it's so much more than that. And first of all, there are many causes of dementia. Mm -hmm. So, so two people with dementia, it's like saying two people with a broken bone, but there's a lot of bones that could be broken. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're suffering from the same condition. So likewise with dementia, there are so many causes and some of them are actually reversible. You know, if you're dehydrated, you can suffer some from a symptoms of dementia. If you've had too much to drink, <coughs> you can have a, a um, medicine, a bad medicine interaction. And in many cases, those are temporary or reversible dementias. But the majority that we think about are not like Alzheimer's. And there's a lot more causes of dementia than I, I, I had a social media post on, I think it was Twitter that said, you know, there's eight different types of dementia <coughs> and my local um, Alzheimer's association chapter, which is the Northern California, Northern Nevada chapter sent me a private message that said, well, actually there's more. And I'm like, well, yeah, but this, I had this graphic and it was, it was a good <laughs> graphic. Yeah. There are and you know, but it's like, well, you also don't want to overwhelm people with like, well, there's actually, I don't remember how many, but it's a lot more than we think of. You know, most people think of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia. If they've had any kind of, I don't want to say training, but if they've read anything about brain diseases, they might know about Lewy body, but that might be the extent of it. So it's like, you know, well, there's a lot there. Strokes can cause dementia. That's true. <clears throat> a lot of brain just brain trauma accidents yeah so. um that's like what um there's a gentleman or a gal in my support group whose husband's got well they think he's got cte chronic oh i forget exactly what cte stands for half the time i remember half the time i don't um and he also may have parkinson's and it's really hard to diagnose exactly what he's got going on so it's definitely it's definitely a challenge knowing what's going on in other people's brains and when they can't tell you because they're not aware of what they've been losing it just makes diagnosing and treating even more difficult correct that's all correct it's really so, hard yeah so backing so, up one step did did you so you did take people out on some outings we went on two, we did two test runs and we had more planned and then we had a, a, an extended rainy season here. And that, yes, we did. <laughs> that uh, put the kibosh on actually several, but we did do two. We did um, one which was at a cathedral, a huge cathedral here in Sacramento called the Cathedral of Blessed Sacrament. 
And they have a program where they pack bags of food for the homeless, I believe four days a week. So we went in in an afternoon, one afternoon and packed some bags that were gonna be handed out the next morning. And then we also had a private tour. We met the rector and then we had a private behind the scenes tour of the cathedral. And it was lots of fun. What was interesting was we had a gentleman who was in the early stages of dementia and his wife, and he was very easygoing. She was the one who was just enjoying the outing so much. And she said, I never get out anymore. I mean, we don't get to do things like this. So she was the one who was just really bouncing around um, and having a lot of fun. And then we also did, um, a, we volunteered at the Book Den, which is part of the Sacramento Public Library system. They have a huge, huge warehouse of books. And we, um, we sorted through some books, alphabetized them, and that was a lot of fun too. It was, it was, they were both good outings and beneficial and we got good feedback. But as I said, there were, we started encountering too many problems with just targeting that population. You know, the rainy season, the loved ones didn't want to take them out in the rain, and um, or they didn't want to drive in the rain, or it was just not a good day. They woke up in the morning and that was not a good day. So that's when we started looking around saying, you know, there's other people doing these activities. Let's support them because they're struggling to make ends meet or they're having to charge. Uh, and we want to we want to be more the the source of funding those existing programs and so, so when did you pivot to that this past summer yeah this the uh, this um last several months what i did not know i did a name change because caregiver pathways was just too long and kind of confusing to people and so that took up a lot of time doing the, the all the paperwork for the state and federal government and so it's just been a, a slow process, but we are virtually there now and are, we're just really excited. Like I said, we, we've got some fundraising activities already planned and, um, and working with the Sacramento County for some support too. So, so it, it's very exciting and we know that there's a huge need and we'll be getting more and more involved with trying to help seniors. You know, one thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is that when, um, when people are isolated or lo and, and or lonely, they're two really two different topics, but there are ramifications to that beyond just an emptiness of their life. There are a lot of health issues associated with isolation and loneliness. There's an increase in um, earlier death. There's an increase, they believe, in onset of dementia. There's even just um, increases in common colds. And there's a certainly problems with um, sleeping disorders and, and the onset of depression. You know, if you think about it, if, if your loved ones are no longer with you, either physically they passed away or mentally they have dementia. Um, so you're alone in that regard. If you have children, odds are they've grown up and moved on. They're in, they have their own lives. Your friends are no longer just down the street. You're not driving. You might even be um, suffering from hearing impairment. So you, even the phone is not an easy source of connection. So there's a lot of these factors that can be addressed but for a senior who's lonely um, and isolated, they may not know how. You know, buses can, there are ways we can reach out to seniors and get them out of the house. The, the challenge is finding them and finding organizations that will do that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, my husband's got a friend who just started delivering for Meals on Wheels. And unfortunately, her first experience was not great. Oh, really? Yeah, I went with a friend of mine who drives for Meals on Wheels and it was I mean it was senior citizens who were deep poverty which is hard to like I don't see it on a daily basis where I live so it being so close to where I live you know it's in in the same city or 
on the outskirts of my city it was it was an eye opener and everybody was friendly and nice so i'm not sure i'm wondering if they were she was new and different and so they were a little bit standoffish and a little bit rude because you know none of us really like change and i don't know it was interesting i didn't get a lot of details but sometimes it's it's hard to ask for help it's hard to accept help yeah you know and it's although i just did a senior resources event where there was a lot of free things and there was a lot of people like me offering resources and of course you know with these things you always have stuff to give away on your table and oh my gosh some of these people just like they just came at you for the free candy and anything you had that was free it didn't matter if they had any use for it whatsoever <laughs> and i was like back off <laughs> it was like back off vultures i'm not ready for this yet <laughs> and there's one gal she's a realtor here in town uh, she's also a neighbor and a friend of ours she ran out of giveaways so she left like 40 minutes before the thing was over and it was only a two-hour event so it's just it's wow. really interesting yep. that population because the the senior citizens that i interact with on a regular basis are either the residents where my mom lives and that's always fun quotes around the word fun and then there's the retirees that are in my rotary group who are obviously very active and engaged and that's kind of what i think of it's like i have polar opposite visions of senior citizens so the the ones in between the people i deal with on a regular basis don't always come to mind you know like like you said people who are isolated and hard to get out of the house and it's crazy you know we recently had the uh, paradise fires right mm -hmm. And I believe that all the people who died were seniors, if not all, then the majority of them. Probably. Were I know there was. They couldn't get out, and people didn't know to go get them and, at, and you know, put them in the car with them as they were escaping. Well, it happened so fast, too. Right, but nonetheless, I mean, these people were really isolated. They had no, they had no option, and that's the sort of awareness that um that i think is important that we have and that we promote that people are isolated and lonely and that, that there are ways to help these people and you and can either help them directly through inviting them over having activities going to go visit or alternatively through groups like rose bear where you can donate money or or um you know assets things crafts or or tickets to a show or whatever it might be and know that those people who need it will receive these benefits and that we're going to try to combat the isolation and loneliness that makes sense and the point with the fires that we had in paradise it's been about 11 months now it's i think a lot of times we're comfortable in our home we feel secure in our home. We don't want to leave. We're afraid if we leave, what will happen to our stuff? So, I and I think that gets worse as we age. If you don't have an evacuation plan, which most of us probably don't, it's hard to know what to do. And that fire moved so fast. I mean, it was like grab crap and run. I mean, that, that was about all the time you had. We, um, as Rotarians, there is was a Paradise Rotary Club and i think about 50 percent of their club lost homes and another significant percentage lost homes and businesses and the rotary clubs basically of northern california and nevada raised over a million dollars to help the town of paradise rebuild and do what they needed to do because what a mess i mean the whole town is gone yep. and it's it, horrible you know it's, if you're older and you've got to find housing it was hard enough for you know the average able-bodied person that might have more resources if you're on a fixed income and now you got to find a place to live yeah isolation is definitely a not not a good thing for you no and it's it's like a hidden problem just by the nature of that the people are isolated 
You know, it's not to take away from other social concerns, but a lot of the um, other issues are visible. We see it. And so we're aware of it. You know, we're aware of animal abuse or of hunger or of homelessness. But if a person is isolated, by definition, they're out of sight. Yeah. And, and that's a growing number of people. I mean, there are people who are, as you age, you become more likely to be a fall risk. That's just, that's just normal. But there are many people who self-isolate because of the fear that they'll go out and they'll fall. And falling, as we know, is a major contributor to one's rapid decline. So, so people start to self-isolate. And then, then you get to the point when you've done that, well, you know, what's, what does it matter if I just eat candy bars? You know, who cares? <laughs> so you start to, or do I really need to shower? Or these clothes, I've worn them for the last five days. No one's coming over. The dog doesn't reject me if I stink. So, <laughs> you know, why bother changing? So we start to slowly self-neglect. You start to self-isolate, then you start to self-neglect. And it becomes a snowball of, of a downward spiral. So that's when, you know, people start to become depressed. They're lonely and they become depressed. I mean, it's a whole separate topic of being lonely, but not being isolated. I mean, mental health can really come into play when you talk about loneliness, because you can be living with a lot of people and have an active social life and, and professional life and still feel incredibly lonely. That's a different category that we're not addressing. We're more addressing the seniors who are isolated and lonely. Well, people in early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's frequently self-isolate because it's hard. Like, I'm terrible at remembering names. I mean, really terrible. Always been terrible with names. And it's embarrassing when, you know, our Rotary Club has about 100 people, and I will have to tell my husband who is very good at remembering people's names the new gal who looks like and then describe her and she was wearing blah 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 today i could do all that but if that was a you know when somebody comes up to me and they start talking to me and it's like hey i i know i should remember more about you but i don't because yeah it's just the way my brain is wired it's not okay. anything to worry about because it's not not anything new unfortunately <laughs> But when you realize I have a hard time keeping up with conversations because your processing is slower or you you can't remember the details of the latest blockbuster movie or the TV shows, or if you're in book club, maybe you have a hard time discussing the book because the details start to get really fuzzy and you're a little embarrassed because that's the whole point of book club. Or It's very common for people in the early stages of memory loss to withdraw socially, which is definitely not a good thing for them to do, but it's understandable. Right. It's, it's a it's a combination of the, the self-isolation that you're talking about. A lot of times it's out of embarrassment. They know they have an issue and they're embarrassed. And then there's also the forced isolation. They can no longer perform their job. They should no longer be driving. They can no longer do crafts and hobbies that they used to do. You know, if, um, they used to do airplane models or boat models, and that becomes too complex, or they were part of a cooking uh, club, or they used to go out and do wine tasting, and now they're on meds that don't allow them to drink alcohol. And there's a lot of outside factors that also force the isolation. And you combine that with the self-isolation, the embarrassment, there's a, there's increased decline you know it's exactly the opposite of what they should be doing and yet it's kind of a natural outgrowth of their situation to to become isolated the so good sounds like that there are organizations and there are people who are becoming aware of this and that are wanting to do activities and um but are are on a are bootstrapping it to try to pull it together and that's where we come in to try to help them out yeah, that sounds fantastic because as the population ages, there's more and more needs and less and less people to fill them. 
I mean, the millennial generation, I'm in between, I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm between the two big generations. But the millennials, they're in their 30s. So most of them. My daughter's a millennial. She's almost 28. They're busy with building their career and raising children and all of that stuff we do in our younger adulthood, which, man, that really makes me feel old to <laughs> say that. And then, you know, but there's not as many people in my generation to help with the volunteering that's needed, the um, philanthropic stuff that needs to be done. And all of these people that like you've been dealing with, getting them out of their homes and engaged in the community to maybe do some of the things, you know, donate their time, treasures and talent. They might not have a lot of treasures, money to give, but if they have time and talent to give, it's gonna benefit charities, and the person doing the giving. And that's that's a fantastic thing that you're trying to connect all those people. Right, and don't forget there's a secondary population who become isolated because of the primary population. And those are the caregivers that we've been talking about. Yeah. So when you, I mean, as you know, especially adult daughters frequently end up quitting their job, having to stay home, taking care of mom, taking care of dad, taking care of whomever it might be. And as those caregiving needs increase and become more demanding, the caregiver's life becomes more and more isolated. And people don't know what to say and don't know what to do. So they start, they stop stopping by to visit or inviting you out because you've said no too many times because you have to take care of your loved one. Or um, they're awkward with your loved one. They don't know what to, how to be with your mom or your dad or whomever it might be. And so the caregivers also begin to find that they're um, increasingly becoming isolated. Yeah. That's, that's another population that really suffers. Well, that, that statement ties into an episode that I just did, which was how to give help to a caregiver who has not asked for it. Because we're not programmed to ask for help and it feels risky asking for help and sometimes you know i'm a little bit of a control freak there's things that i like done done certain ways so when you ask for help you have to accept the help as it's given you can't dictate well okay i need you to do x y and z like this that's just way too much and knowing how to like you said friends stop asking you out because you've said no too often well when it's if we can connect people with geez, I've asked Jennifer to bunko the last four months. She never, I'm not going to ask her anymore because she can't come. It would be useful for people when they're dealing with a caregiver, when they're friends with a caregiver or distant family member is to, to he, you know, listen to the episode on how to provide help when it's not asked for. Because that was, that was a very enlightening conversation that I had. But there are, there are easy, simple ways that you can do little things that would help that caregiver. And it would kind of help with the isolation because that's terrible for our brain as a caregiver. You know, it's physically demanding, it's emotionally demanding, it's emotionally draining. And now your friends stop calling you because you're always saying no because of everything else. Yeah. I, I wrote it recently, I wrote a, well, recently, I don't know, this past year, I wrote an article and it was all the things not to say to a caregiver. And one, the, the worst one, the biggest violation in my opinion is take care of yourself, which we tell caregivers all the time. Well, take care of yourself. You know, you need to get more sleep. You need to eat better. You need to, don't forget about your needs. And then that's the parting words. Well, that's just another pressure that you're putting on a caregiver, another responsibility for them to shoulder. You know, if they were able to, go to the store and pick out some organic foods and come home and fix a lovely dinner. Don't you think they would? But what are they gonna do with their loved one who needs their attention? Bring them to the store while they peruse the, you know, the turnips? I mean, that's <laughs> just not gonna happen. Or, um, yeah, so there's a number of times when, yeah, I'd love to go out and have more exercise or go socialize with my friends. That also requires me to coordinate care for my loved one. And if it's a bad day, then I have to cancel because he or she will only, you know, I'm the one who can influence them the best, but they won't listen to me. 
So um, the person you interviewed, I'm sure they made a lot of suggestions, which, you know, which I also had in the article, which is, you know, bring food over to the family, to the caregiver and loved one and bring them in disposable plates and, and dishes so they don't have to return dishes to you. Arrange for times to, um, to take the person who needs care out so that the caregiver can just sleep or do what they need to do. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things, but oh boy, it really gets me riled up when people say take care. <laughs> well, I've dealt with so many caregivers, not necessarily guests, but people I've encountered and they almost have a martyr syndrome. It's like, oh, it's such a privilege to be a caregiver and I'm going to keep my mom home forever. I'm never going to put her in a quote institution, which is the wrong word. And they have no clue what it's like. My mom has declined tremendously in the last three, four months. She's got some physical issues. She's got a growth next to one kidney that sends mixed messages to her poor brain. And she said, you know, she'll say, I gotta go to the bathroom right now. And, and of course she moves so slow that right now is like almost terrifying to hear. And then you take her into the bathroom and she's like, why am I here? like okay and then you know she's always like i've shown up four out of the last five visits she's in a state of distress and undress changing her pants and she'll make a comment it usually it's hand signals and words she doesn't actually say you know i had an accident or i wet myself it's just all body language because she's also using all the wrong words and I will pick up her pants off the bed, either to help her back into them or put them in the laundry basket. And they're not wet. And it's like, why are you all stressed out about being wet? If you're not wet, I'm like, Bleh. so it's been, and the, I, the neurologist has said that the decline, because of this issue, the decline will happen more rapidly, which I have noticed over the summer. She went from, you know, like whatever level she was at and just, she has slid into where she's at now so fast. It's been, it's been really hard to keep up. And I have the benefit of talking to lots of people. I can reach out to lots of people and go, what the hell do I do? <laughs> Help. <laughs> I need some advice. Whereas these people who want to keep mom home forever, it's like, that's a great goal, but don't kill yourself trying to do that. And so that's when I tell people, you know, you have to take care of yourself because if something happens to you, what, what are you going to do with your mom? You know, so I always suggest, you know, take a walk around the block, you know, go out and smell, smell flowers and, you know, go to the neighbor's yard, smell their roses, whatever, just little things, get out of the house, get into the sunshine, the hopefully fresh air, those kind of things. Cause yeah, I know how it is going to the gym, going on a bike ride. It's like, it takes time. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting what you were talking about uh, and the challenges with your mother and other people will have comparable challenges. You know, I, I don't know if you know that I'm doing research. I'm interviewing people, um, both couples who do, neither have dementia and those who, whose partner either currently does or did. And um, we're talking about not only caring for the person with dementia, but almost more importantly, what do you think the person with dementia would have wished for you? So that's the, the question for the people whose partner currently has dementia or had. And for the couples who neither of them have, it's talking about, well, if you were to get dementia, what would you like and what would you wish for your spouse or your partner? And we don't often think about that. You know, it's all the focus is on what's best for the for the person with dementia. For me, with my still my I'm functioning mentally, what I have to make these decisions for my loved one and what's best for that person. But wouldn't it be nice if the person with dementia could step out for a moment and say, look, this is what I want for you because I know my condition is not meeting your needs, is not fulfilling your life, is a challenge and a drain to you. Here's my wish for you. And so, um, you know, certainly if any of your listeners are interested in learning more about this research or participating in it, it's all anonymous. Um, I'd be happy to to engage with them. Yeah, you interviewed both my husband and I on that. 
Did I? I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I, I'm up to, I think I'm it's up been to, almost a year. Because yeah, I, I've been up, I'm up to, um, I, this afternoon I'm interviewing my 69th couple. So. Are you finding a trend? Um, I would say that a couple of things pop up that are interesting. One is I'm surprised at how many couples are not in agreement, meaning they might, one might say, yes, yes, we've talked about, you know, what our wishes are for each other um, quite a bit. And that person will go into detail. And then I'll talk to the other spouse because I interview them separately. And the other spouse might say, well, you know, we've joked about it, but I don't consider that a real conversation. Or, or and sometimes they're even more radically different. So that's been interesting to see the, the difference in, um, in kind of understanding about the conversations they've, they, they both think they've had or not had. The other thing is that, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that people have made if someone has a certain political slant or a certain religious slant, they're going to have a, a more um, unified response. And people who are of opposite politically or opposite religiously, you know, maybe don't have a lot of religion or, or what have you, um, they're probably going to think another way. And I have not found that to be true. I have found that on the topic of dementia, uh, since dementia doesn't discriminate and it can affect anybody, uh, the answers are really not linked to people's philosophical beliefs or religious beliefs. I mean, yeah, there's some, there's a few people who have stood on those grounds, but overall not nearly as many as I would have expected. That's interesting. Now, do you know offhand if most of the couples that you talk to where neither have a memory issue, if any of them have like where my position, because I can almost guarantee that if we were not dealing with my mom, my husband's answers would be different because of how he feels, you know, it, some of it was religious upbringing and the way he feels about me. It's, he would end up in that martyr syndrome where I'm going to keep her at home. I'm going to do everything I can. Essentially they end up killing themselves trying to do everything because that's what they think is expected. But I know because of what he's witnessed with my mom, he knows he can't do that. He couldn't keep me at home. I mean, like there's no way my mom could live with somebody 24 seven now with, without somebody that's dedicated to the care 24 seven. I understand. I forgot to tell the neurologist this. Um, she had a neurology appointment a couple weeks ago. My mom was always a really good sleeper as far as I knew. And now the caregivers are telling me that she's getting up in the middle of the night for two, three hours and sitting with the overnight caregivers that are there. And that's different. And you can imagine if she was in my house and I had people during the day so I could keep doing my job. Now she's up in the middle of the night. I'd be up in the middle of the night. I mean, it's just, it's some, they get to a point where they need somebody that can handle whatever is going on in their life 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever. There's a gal where my mom lives. She's, she's a newer resident and I would assume that she's in the later stages of Alzheimer's. When she walks, she's literally bent in half at the waist. So her face is pointed at the floor and she shuffles along and she does not sit down. She doesn't stop. I don't know how they feed her. I might have to, I'm, I've been threatening to go and have a meal with my mom to kind of see how she's functioning with eating. I haven't done that for a while, so it's probably overdue. But now I'm like curious, how do you feed this woman? She doesn't ever sit down. She actually has a caregiver that just walks around and around and around and around with her. I feel so bad for that guy. And there's no way you could keep somebody like that at home. I don't think she's verbal. I haven't heard anything. She just keeps walking. And I've explained to them because I learned from Tipa Snow that people like her, generally what happens is their mind gets in a loop, you know, and it's like, for whatever reason, they're like, I got to walk here, blah, 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 blah. 
you know, and then you have to kind of look for the place where you can break that chain, that loop. And they haven't found it yet with this poor woman. And it's just, if you haven't experienced it or seen it, you have no clue what the end years could look like. And that's, that's my, I'm trying to gently share that information. I, it's hard sometimes for me to talk about my mom because I know, man, she'd kill me. <laughs> if she understood, she would so not be happy with me. And it's, sometimes I still feel uncomfortable because I know that she wouldn't like that. But it's, I find when people say, oh, my mom's been doing this and this is what I found work, that helps me. So I share what I can about mom and what we're going through so that other people can learn and hopefully not make mistakes like most of us have done. <laughs> well, your mother might have a different opinion than what you think, because if she could see her condition and the effect it's having on you, and that you are in turn helping others so that they don't have to go through the same suffering or they can be more educated and knowledgeable, you know, really, I wouldn't be surprised if she wouldn't be just tremendously proud of you. She might think I was just like my dad because that's very similar to what he would do. My dad was a Rotarian for 45 years. So he, he was always very much into helping you get to where you needed to go. Sometimes he helped you in ways you didn't want. Yeah. I remember when I was in college, this was in the eighties, the late eighties, he would mail me business articles. I was like, ah, <laughs> I think I'm really glad when I was in college, they didn't have email back then. Yeah. <laughs> Sounding really old again. Um, because when he, he never emailed me business articles because by the time he got into like forwarding emails, it was all political nonsense, which was not fun. So, you know, that was, that was the kind of thing he did. He was like, oh, this article would be really useful if Jennifer read it. And I find myself doing that with my daughter. It's like, oh, I should, oh wait, I'm not, I'm not, texting that to her because I texted her one three days ago. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to overwhelm her with stuff, you know, information because she's more than capable of finding it on her own or asking. So that was how my dad was. So yeah, I think she would think I was like my dad, but there is that voice that says, man, she would really hate, well, she'd hate the way she is right now. So yeah, I don't think anybody wishes dementia for themselves or oh no i know she line. didn't she kept saying i don't want to end up like my mother and it was obvious she was already on that path yeah it was terrible because it was like what do you want me to do <laughs> i can't kill you that's not legal <laughs> that would not do anything favorable for my life if i did that so it's just it's it's a tough disease and there's more and more people like you and i out there trying to do everything we can to help you know, the vulnerable population of people with memory loss and isolated seniors. And I think it's fantastic. So I'm really glad I touched base with you the other day. Yeah, I am too. I really appreciate it. Is it okay to give my um, contact information? Definitely. On, on, on your podcast? And oh, definitely. So, so if anyone is interested in learning more about our online directory, which is the Silver Lining Network and Directory, and Look, you can Google that, silverliningnetworkanddirectory.com. Um, you can see the home page. That, or if they're interested in Rose Bear, which is the now our nonprofit, and we're going to be supporting other organizations that are targeting the seniors who are isolated and lonely. Um, if they're interested in that, and then thirdly, if they're interested in my research, if they're interested in being interviewed, um, all those three paths can be. Um, can be uh, walked down by just contacting me at uh, Rebecca. It's the conventional spelling, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, then the at sign, Rose, R-O-Z as in zebra, E-B-E-A-R, rosebear.org. Um, so that would be a, a good way to contact me. And I would be happy to, you know, to connect and, and help however I can. That's awesome. And one quick last question. What is your end goal with this research? Or is it just curiosity? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, I, I actually think that, I mean, the, the whole focus of the research is whether or not people plan for dementia and the consequences of either planning or not planning. So there's really no judgment on my part. Um, and I'm now, as I said, I'm 
this afternoon I'm going to interview my 69th couple or one person of the 69th couple. And um, I'm, my goal is to get to 100. And then I'm also interviewing people who I call influencers. So people who are in roles where they can influence people who are grappling with the dementia. And that would be people in the clergy, uh, marriage and family counselor who specializes in, in helping people with dementia and their loved ones. Uh, people like that. Actually, we were talking about Laura Wayman in the beginning of the of the podcast. I've interviewed her, and so that those Q and A's will be in the book. So I want, ultimately the goal is to have a book. Okay. And um, I mean, I without giving away too many secrets, I know you know, but I've written what I call a compassion contract, and I uh, I definitely ask people who I interview about that, and it, it deals with both the care and wishes of someone who does not have dementia as well as the care and wishes of the person who does. And so ultimately, I think my goal is, is to, to collect it all into a book. Hmm, that will be fantastic. That's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> it's always goals. Goals are good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I appreciate getting back together and catching up and finding out what else is going on. I'm sorry I missed the two outings that you did, but man, life just kind of seems to be hurtling along <laughs> at rapid speed, and that's just insane. It's always 10 things to do and time to do about six or seven of them. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky, yep. <laughs> that is yep. true. Less time on Mondays when I visit mom. That, that's when time really drags by. We went to the fabric store this this week. She loved that. So that was That's one of my... Now that the kids are back in school, we can't go watch kids at the park and the pool, which makes us sound like creepy old ladies, but <laughs> that's what we do in the, when the kids are out of school and I have to find new, um, different activities to keep her entertained when the kids are in school. Cause I go from about two to four. So even though the kids are almost out of school, they're not, they don't usually get to the parks and stuff until about the time when it's time to take her back for dinner. So it's always a challenge and I don't know how long we'll be going to be able to keep going out. So it's a good thing that you're doing to help keep people from getting isolated and working with organizations that provide that help. So that's a really good thing. And like I said, I'm really glad we, we caught up again. <laughs> I am too. And you know, when your mom is ultimately gone, you'll have the peace of mind that you were there for her on a regular basis and that you brought her joy in her favor in her, you know, nearing her final days. So um, th those are good, uh, good feelings for you to carry with you going forward. Yeah, we've had some good times this summer. She said a few times, well, there's one day we came back and she told me that about three times what a fantastic day she had and she appreciated it so much. And then she said she loved me, which I haven't heard in I don't know how long. So I hang on to that one. And she tells people anywhere close to us that I'm her best friend. So that could be a whole lot worse. And I get a lot of appreciation, but it's, it's starting to shift. We came back from the fabric store and I had leftover, um, chocolate spice bread from the, a picnic we were at the day before and she, we had this dark chocolate bread on a white plate and she's literally waving the plate around and I'm like any second that bread's gonna go flying I'm like I'm gonna get it right in the face that's what's gonna happen with this bread and it was like what the heck it was like she was like more normal is not the right word normal for her but like from four to four thirty, it was like she just had this almost out of body experience. It was really bizarre. And then they fed her dinner, and I left. So <laughs> it's like she was starting to get hostile. So I'm like, okay, I hear the dinner dishes getting put on the table. It's time to go. <laughs> yeah, well, it could have been some sundowning. Yeah, which I need to do more research on that because. Does it just happen at a specific time of day or does it happen more at sundown or? I'm... Yeah, it tends to happen more at the end, towards the end of the day and we're, hence the name sundowning. And there's all different philosophies as to why. I mean, no one knows 100%, but one is that people are just 
their brain is just tired, right? From trying to use it and the effort it takes to use a brain that's not fully functioning. Um, another philosophy is it has to do with light and the changing of the, the natural light. Sometimes people, um, their, their circadian rhythm is off. And so they're not sleeping like your mother, um, you know, is not necessarily sleeping well at night. And then if you had her out doing activities, she's just kind of crashing uh, because she's exhausted and can't communicate that to you. Um, there's a lot of different reasons, but it's very common that people become agitated in the late afternoon and, and oftentimes violent. So, or verbally abusive, um, more so than other times of the day. I didn't get verbal abuse, but I just, I got like almost hostile body language and, and kind of barbed statements, just like, and facial expressions. So she probably was tired. I always thought sundowning happened at sundown when you have that, well, photographers call it the golden light, but when the, when the sun has just gone down and there's very little contrast, and it's, it's almost hard to tell you know, is this a shadow or is this the, you know, the bumper of the car? You know, there's that time when everything is like flat and I don't have depth perception. So I, I can understand what it is. Somebody with Alzheimer's is seen because I, there are times when things are closer to me than I think. And then all of a sudden it's like, ah, and at that time of the day, the sundown time of day, I don't like to drive because it's just, it's, there's not enough contrast to tell the difference between, you know, here and there and over, you know, it's like, it's weird. It's, it's really interesting. And it's only a short period of time, but I didn't think about the not sleeping right and the circadian rhythm being off. Because I've done some research on sundowning and there doesn't seem to be a lot of good information. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to do, I'll have to find somebody that can speak on that for us. There you go. Well, you have a good evening. And once again, I thank you for catching everybody up. And I will make sure that your website and everything are linked in the show notes for everybody. And the last episode you were on will be linked so that everybody can just find out all about you. <laughs> Great. Well, I really appreciate it. And I'm more than happy to um, connect with any of your listeners. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that offer. All right. Thanks so much for having me. And I look forward to the next time we connect. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.